All right, so the next nonspecific cellular defense that we have that's part of our innate immunity are these NK cells. Just to recap, we have three types of lymphocytes. We have our T lymphocytes or T cells, our B cells or B lymphocytes, and the natural killer cells or NK cells. So I want to emphasize that when it comes to the B and the T lymphocytes, it's our adaptive immunity, which will be the next part of our discussion. While the NK cells are part of the innate immunity. So these natural killer cells are important in immunological surveillance. What that means is they will monitor blood and lymph, looking for anything that shouldn't be there. Now, keep in mind, these cells are non-phagocytic and, of course, are one type of lymphocytes. So what exactly are they looking for? Well, such things as cancer cells. A cancer cell was once a normal cell that has undergone several DNA mutations, literally transforming that normal cell to now becoming a cancerous cell. Another type of abnormal cell would be a cell that's been infected by a virus. Viruses are intracellular parasites. What that means is they literally will invade our DNA. They will take over the cell. And in the process, the cell will start producing the viruses. And what's neat about these NK cells is they will do this even before the adaptive immunity is activated. Now, they're not picky as to the type of cancer cell or the type of virus that has infected the cell. They are after cells that should not be there. Before I go any further, let's look at a normal cell. Okay, so we have a perfectly normal, healthy cell. Our cells will display on a major histocompatibility complex one, details to come later, a self-antigen. So a self-antigen is telling our immune cells, do not attack me. I am part of the same body. I am part of the same team. However, if this normal cell has transformed into a cancer cell, or has been hijacked by a virus to where now it becomes a virus-infected cell, two scenarios can occur. Number one, it will no longer display an MHC1, a major histocompatibility complex 1, along with the self-antigen. Or, if it does display an MHC1 with a self-antigen, this abnormal cell will display what I like to call kill me surface proteins. So it's saying, attack me immune cells, I am not normal. I've either transformed to a cancer cell or I've been infected by a virus. And these are what these NK cells are looking for. So how do they neutralize these abnormal cells, these cancer cells or virus infected cells? Well, they do so by inducing apoptosis. Apoptosis is programmed cell death or cytolysis. So cytolysis is where the abnormal cell literally ruptures, as you can see right here. So how does the NK cell induce cytolysis so we can clear our body of these cancer cells or virus infected cells? they'll get very close to the cancer cell or virus-infected cell, as we see here with this diagram. And now the cancer cell or virus-infected cell, once again, is either not displaying an MHC1 or is displaying kill-me proteins. So now the NK cell will get extremely close and will release perforin exocytosis. So perforin is exocytosed. It will literally form pores on that abnormal cell. In other words, these proteins will penetrate that plasma membrane, and now we form pores created by this porphyrins. 
which means all sorts of things can now enter this abnormal cell. As a result of that, it literally will rupture. And that's one way to take care of these abnormal cells by these natural killer cells. The second way that a natural killer cell can neutralize abnormal cells such as cancer cells and virally infected cells or virus infected cells, after they release through the process of exocytosis, perforin that will penetrate through the plasma membrane of these abnormal cells, they will then follow that up by exocytosis of what's called granzymes. So granzymes are enzymes that will lead to the eventual death of the cell through a process called apoptosis, programmed cell death. Now, one advantage of undergoing apoptosis is that there will now be leftover material where the macrophage can now engulf it. So the macrophage will phagocytose it, digest what was once a normal cell, exocytose or discard whatever it doesn't need, but it will also take a little bit of that abnormal cell, process it, and of course display it on an MHC. So this image right here shows us essentially the same process as the top image where the cancer cell or virus infected cell is being neutralized by this natural killer cells by first releasing perforins and then granzymes leading to once again apoptosis. And what we have over here are natural killer cells that have surrounded this abnormal cell that will eventually lead to its neutralization or destruction. Now that we've finished nonspecific cellular phagocytes and natural killer cells, let's now look at nonspecific chemical, beginning with inflammation. Whenever body tissues are injured, either due to trauma, heat, irritating chemicals, or infections, it'll trigger an inflammatory response. Now, what are the benefits of inflammation? Well, it'll prevent the spread of damaging agents. It'll dispose of any cellular debris and pathogens. It will alert the adaptive immune response. It'll set the stage for repair. There are four signs of acute inflammation that can be referred to as cardinal signs. The first is redness, and you'll see why that is. Redness is known as erythema. We will have heat around that inflammation. We will have swelling called edema and as well as pain. Because anytime we injure ourselves or any type of damage to our body tissue, it will result in the release of pain chemicals that will bind to pain receptors, therefore giving us the sensation of pain. There are four stages of inflammation. The first one is inflammatory chemical release, followed by vasodilation and increased vascular permeability, phagocyte mobilization, chemotaxis and leukocytosis, and as well as the delivery of plasma proteins. So let's first look at step number one, or stage number one, the release of inflammatory chemicals. Now the two main cells that are responsible for the release of chemicals that causes inflammation will be our mast cells and our basophils. Our mast cells are found among our tissue cells, so we do not find mast cells circulating in blood, unlike the basophils. Basophils we find in blood, although a very small percentage are found in blood. Overall, these basophils make up a very small percentage of our leukocytes. In fact, you're looking at about 0.5 to 1% of all the leukocytes that we have. So the basophils have the ability to leave blood and enter the tissue cells where we have this tissue damage. The key inflammatory chemicals that are released by these mast cells and basophils is histamine. Histamine is a potent vasodilator that will cause the vasodilation of local arterioles. Don't forget, it is the arterioles that will lead into the capillary bed. It will also increase capillary permeability. 
In other words, those intercellular clefts that we find between the endothelial cells that make up the tunica intima of the capillary will begin to widen. So they get wider, which makes the blood vessel, the capillary specifically, more permeable. So looking at the illustration that I made to the right, with the release of histamine, we will have leakiness of the capillaries increasing. And by making the capillary leakier because of the widening of those intercellular clefts, we will have an increase in filtration. There will be an increase in interstitial fluid called edema. In addition, histamine will vasodilate the arterioles. And by vasodilating, more blood will flow into the capillaries. Because of that, it will result in increase in redness called erythema. And of course, by vasodilating, more blood will flow into the capillary. Now blood is warm. Because there's increase of blood, the area where we have the inflammation will become warmer because it generates heat. And there's a reason for that, as we'll see in the next slide. Now, there are other inflammatory mediators or chemicals that are also secreted. Your kinins, your prostaglandins, your leukotrienes, and complement. I'm not too concerned for you to know these other inflammatory mediators, other than just knowing that vasodilation of local arterioles will occur, increase of capillary permeability, they'll attract leukocytes to the area, it's a positive chemotactic agent, trigger pain receptors, stimulating the release of more inflammatory chemicals, intensifying their effects. Now, as I said, the only chemical that I would like you to know as far as the inflammatory chemicals that are released is histamine. The second stage of inflammation is vasodilation and increased vascular permeability. As we saw, the mast cells and basophils will secrete histamine, a very potent vasodilator, and it increases capillary permeability. By vasodilation, once again, of the arteriole, it leads to an increase in blood flow through that capillary. Increase in blood flow referred to as hyperemia. And one of the reasons of hyperemia is to increase oxygen and nutrient availability to the cells. They will need the nutrients and the oxygen if the tissue is to repair itself. There is also going to be an increase in redness, and that is referred to as erythema. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, because blood is warm, heat will be generated. What is the purpose of that? By increasing the temperature, it will increase the metabolic activity of the cells. For example, the immune cells that are there to clear the area of any pathogen. And there will be, of course, an increase in capillary permeability, making the capillary especially leaky due to the intercellular clefts that become wider, increasing infiltration. Therefore, we will have swelling and edema. Now, this excess interstitial fluid will now be referred to as exudate. So this fluid will contain clotting factors, antibodies, microbes, cellular debris, and not to mention our immune cells. Now because of edema, one result could be pushing against nerve endings, and this will result in the sensation of pain. Now pain can also be triggered due to the release of toxins from bacteria as well as prostaglandins and kinins. So one benefit of pain is that it motivates you to protect that area because otherwise you may re-injure that area. Now, what's the benefit of edema? Well, by increasing the interstitial fluid, which we now refer to as exudate, will help sweep the foreign material into the lymphatic vessels for processing in the lymph node. So the idea behind this is to get as much of that fluid into a lymphatic capillary so that way it ultimately makes its way into the lymph nodes where we find our B cells and our T cells, the cells that are involved in adaptive immunity. The third stage or step 
of inflammation is phagocyte mobilization. So this is where we call in the troops. This is where we call in the immune cells. So chemotaxis and leukocytosis is involved in the mobilization of these phagocytes. Chemotaxis, incidentally, is the movement of immune cells or cells in general in response to a chemical stimulus. I like to refer to it as following a chemical scent trail. So the objective of chemotaxis is to concentrate as many of these phagocytes, as many of these immune cells, to the site of injury. And the way to do that is to release chemicals that will entice or that will stimulate these immune cells to wander to that area. So we're talking about the neutrophils, we're talking about the macrophages. Now, if the inflammation is due to pathogens, then complement can be activated and eventual adaptive immunity will be involved. And that's where we involve our third line of defense immune cells, the B and the T lymphocytes. So we'll talk about complement as part of this presentation because it's part of the innate immunity. And then we'll talk about adaptive immunity in the last segment of the lymphatic system and immunity discussion. This image shows us essentially chemotaxis. So chemicals are released once again from toxins, from other immune cells. So the first ones to show up are often the neutrophils. So what this is showing us essentially is a neutrophil that is leaving the capillary because now the capillary is leakier. So it's made easier for the neutrophils to leave and enter the interstitial fluid where we have the site of injury. And over here, we have the macrophages. So the monocytes, when they're found in blood, will leave the leaky capillary and join the neutrophils to devour or to phagocytose these pathogens at the site of injury. Now, part of this mobilization includes leukocytosis. So leukocytosis is the increase in the numbers of white blood cells, leukocytes. And for this to occur, there will be an increase in leukopoiesis. So this, once again, is all part of mobilizing phagocytes. The last and final stage of this inflammatory response or inflammation is the delivery of plasma proteins. Plasma proteins such as clotting factors and as well as complement proteins. And by having a leakier capillary, it will make it easier for these proteins to leave blood and enter the area. Now, what do these clotting factors do? Well, they're going to form a fibrin mesh, and this will provide a scaffold for repair. In addition, by forming a fibrin mesh, by forming a blood clot, it isolates that injured area. That way, no other additional pathogens can enter during the process of healing. And a blood clot that appears on the surface of our skin is called a scab. And over time, that scab will slowly diminish in size as healing continues. And eventually, when healing is complete, the scab falls right off. I like this image because it's showing us the four steps of inflammation. So once again, we have stage number one, which is the release of inflammatory chemicals, as well as chemotactic factors. We have our mast cells, which is found among our tissue cells in the interstitial fluid, and we have our basophils. So these cells are releasing histamine. And histamine, as we've said, is a vasodilator, so we have an increase in the diameter of the arterioles, therefore more blood flows into that capillary, and that is referred to as hyperemia, and we start to see increase in redness, called erythema, and as well as the production of heat. Not to mention that histamine will increase the leakiness of our capillary. How so? By widening or increasing the size of the gaps, the intracellular cleft specifically, between the endothelial cells. And we can see it right here in this part of the image. 
So that covers number two, vascular changes that involves vasodilation and increase in capillary permeability. With the increase in capillary permeability, we will have more filtration, edema occurs, and now we have the swelling, which is one of the cardinal signs of inflammation. What I want to now focus on is exudate. So I mentioned that in the last slide. Exudate is interstitial fluid plus other stuff. What other stuff are we looking at here? Well, we have the clotting factors, microbes, dead neutrophils, and as well as antibodies. So I want to stress that unless we're looking at inflammation, we would not refer to this as exudate. It would just be referred to as simply interstitial fluid. However, because this is inflammation, we now refer to this as exudate. So now the pressure in that exudate will increase. And this is the idea behind this. Because the mini valves in a lymphatic capillary will swing open. It will open wider, allowing that exudate to enter the lymphatic capillary. And as it does that, bacteria and whatever else is not exudate is swept into that capillary, the lymphatic capillary. Where is it going to? Well, it's destined to go to the lymph node, and that is where we find our B and T lymphocytes, the adaptive immunity cells. Now, in addition, that exudate, that increase in volume, will also push up against sensory nerve endings. So now we have the sensation of pain. As I've already said, that will motivate us to protect that area, preventing any further damage. Now, the third step is recruitment, where we have mobilization of the phagocytes. So in this image, we have our neutrophils, so margination, diapedesis, and this is because of chemotaxis. And this is made easier because of that leaky capillary, but what allows that leukocyte to attach itself to the wall of this capillary is when it binds to a cellular adhesion molecule, or CAM. An example, of course, is selectin. And now that neutrophil wanders into that exudate, that area of injury, and starts phagocytosis. In addition to chemotaxis, we will have leukocytosis, where the numbers of leukocytes will increase. Then the fourth and final stage of inflammation is the delivery of plasma proteins. So clotting factors, antibodies, complement, they all arrive at the scene. And the goal of these clotting factors is to form a blood clot, to form a scab. That way it isolates that area, it protects that area until healing is complete. Let's now look at situations where things have gotten out of hand. For example, pus. It is possible for pus to form. Now pus appears yellowish, so it has a yellow color that is a mixture of dead neutrophils. Remember, neutrophils will die fighting, as well as the damaged tissue cells and living and dead pathogens. Now if the pus does not clear, it can eventually lead to an abscess. So what now happens is as the pus is building and the body's attempt to try and contain that, it will start to lay down collagen fibers. So these collagen fibers will form around that pus, basically walling off that pus. And it could get to the point of where it needs to be surgically drained especially if it's in deeper tissue. Then we have an ulcer. This now involves a superficial infection that we can clearly see. Why is that? It's because the outer layers of the tissue have come off or has slothed off, resulting in an open sore. And by having an open ulcer, I think you and I can agree that this now becomes an entryway for pathogens.